Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and welcome to What The Math. This is a continuation of uh, my attempt at making videos using not my PC that's still broken, but essentially I'm going to be using iPad uh, this time again, using uh, an app called Explain Everything. And we're going to be talking about, about a little bit of mathematics, but not. Uh, hopefully it's not going to be as difficult as the last video. And we're actually going to discuss uh, a very simple question. So. Out of all exoplanets we've discovered so far, and we've found close to about 4,000 by uh, 2016, uh, is there any chance that at least one of these exoplanets, at least one of them, um, is basically Earth-like, something that we can actually go to and colonize? So it's a pretty interesting question. I think it's a pretty um, important question. But, but we're going to assess this uh, from the perspective of mathematics. All right, so let's start with the following. And let's actually start by defining uh, several components that we, we need to have a successful planet for basically our um, our survival. So uh, on, on a planet, like for example, obviously on Earth, uh, we need to have certain things. One of those things is, of course, atmosphere. So uh, here we're not going to actually worry about uh, what kind of atmosphere it is just yet, but this is basically one of them, atmosphere. Two is obviously that as atmosphere has to, has to have a little bit of oxygen or uh, preferably a lot of oxygen, so we need to have oxygen in um, in that atmosphere. Uh, we also would like to actually have liquid water, please and thank you. So that's another important component for us. Um, the planet also has to be in a specific location here. Uh, that location is a region of space uh, also known as Goldilocks zone or habitable zone, but we're going to write it as Goldilocks zone. This is basically a distance from the sun where you can actually have liquid water. Uh, so we're going to write that as well. That's number four. Uh, uh, Earth is not the only planet in that region, so that's why it's important to mention that as well. Uh, we also want to have um, things like, for example, a magnetic magnetosphere, magnetic field that will protect us from um, extra Earth or extraterrestrial radiation. So basically, magnetic fields or something that will protect us. Uh, fortunately for us, Earth has that. Unfortunately for us, Mars and Venus do not. I think number six should also be temperature because we want this to be not too hot, not too cold. Uh, technically, you should be able to have liquid water in uh, as low as, uh, well, negative degrees really, if it's a very, very salty water, or as high as 99 degrees Celsius, which is not really easy for us to survive in. And I think for the number seven, for the last one, I'm going to also add uh, pressure. So at, not just atmosphere, but atmospheric pressure. So this is also kind of important because many, many, many objects have atmosphere, but not so many have uh, proper pressure for us. And so let's actually discuss these and look at these mathematically and try to figure out, so what is the chance that we've already discovered something that's Earth-like, or um, are we going to be looking for a very long time? And the way I wanted to approach this is basically by looking at only certain objects. Here, we're only going to consider objects that have re uh, reached or achieved a so-called hydrostatic equilibrium. This is essentially, at least in uh, space sciences, uh, means that an object has become sort of round-ish or elliptical uh, because of the amount of stuff that it has. We're not going to consider other objects because there's actually so many of them, but for one simple reason, uh, uh, mostly because if an object has achieved um, hydrostatic equilibrium, like many of these objects you see right here, including, of course, Pluto, that is right there. Um, so if, the, if an object has achieved uh, this, a hydrostatic equilibrium and has achieved spherical shape, it really means that uh, there's a high chance it might have atmosphere and possibly uh, be habitable or colonizable at least. Um, however, if it hasn't achieved hydrostatic equilibrium, like for example, Amalthea right here, a satellite um, of uh, Jupiter, uh, this means that it's just too small and we will never be able to colonize this. So this is a no-no. So that's, uh, that's basically going to be the, um, the main idea here. And basically, in total, we have quite um, quite a lot of objects. As a matter of fact, uh, from what I can see on Wikipedia list right here, there is at least 34 objects that are definitely in hydrostatic equilibrium. This includes objects like planets. There's eight planets, obviously. Um, also includes uh, many satellites, many moons of different planets. And of course, also... Um, and also about 15 objects that would technically classify as dwarf planets or um, minor planets. 
And so in total, I believe there's about uh, 42, 42 various objects that uh, are essentially around uh, 42 objects that have achieved hydrostatic equilibrium and will no longer uh, change shapes from from spherical shape or from elliptical shape. So basically, that's uh, that's the idea. We're going to look at these 42 objects. And let's start with the first uh, requirement here, and this is, of course, um, atmosphere. And I think I'm actually going to talk about both atmosphere and pressure, because uh, almost every, or I think possibly every object, every one of those 42 objects have atmosphere. So uh, it's not very uncommon for objects to have some sort of atmosphere. Um, I've recently mentioned that Io has atmosphere that seems to collapse uh, when it's on the dark side of Jupiter. But other than that, all other objects will have some something, some kind of atmosphere. Uh, but pressure, however, is very, very tricky. So here we want to have just the right amount of pressure for us to survive without, basically without wearing any suit. And uh, obviously Earth is one of those objects, so Earth is one. But there's another object that we can actually easily survive on without a suit, at least in terms of pressure. And that object is Titan. I really should have capitalized the letter here. But basically, yeah. So two out of 42 objects, two out of 42 have necessary atmosphere and pressure. So uh, this is something we're going to basically uh, turn into probability problem later, but this is required atmosphere and required uh, pressure. So that's number one requirement. Let's go into number two. And number two here is oxygen. Now, I think it's pretty fair to say that only Earth has um, enough oxygen for us to survive, so this is going to be a very easy one out of 42. So only, this is only Earth. Only Earth has, possesses enough um, oxygen for humans to survive on. Number three is going to be liquid water, but I actually should have specified this a little bit more. Uh, it's not just the liquid water, it's liquid water on the surface. So many, many objects, um, or not many, but quite a few objects have liquid water underneath them. Like for example, Ceres has definitely liquid water um, underneath the ice shell because we've detected uh, cryovolcanism, which can only be formed from liquid water. Uh, Pluto also seems to have liquid water, and I've talked about this previously. Uh, so many objects have this, they have water, but not many objects have liquid water on the surface. So once again, this is actually going to be only one out of 42. Only Earth once again. Uh, so one of out of 42 objects have liquid water. Number four is the location in the solar system. And here we're talking about the habitable zone or Goldilocks zone. Um, and uh, it's not just Earth actually, it is three different objects. So there is three out of 42 planets or objects that are in this zone, and they are, of course, Mars, Venus, and Earth. So all three are in the so-called Goldilocks zone. So the chance of, uh, you know, having a planet in that region out of all objects that we can possibly settle on, at least in our solar system, is about 3 out of 42. Uh, next, number 5 is going to be magnetic field. Now, this one is a little bit more tricky, and that's because, um, well, uh, let me just explain it to you. I'm going to try to explain it to you. Venus doesn't have magnetic field. Venus is actually one of the few objects that doesn't have um, magnetic field in, in a classical way, but it does protect itself from dangerous radiation from the outside because it has uh, some kind of a ionic layer on the surface of the atmosphere that protects the bottom of Venus. But that's a very, very unusual example. It's actually an exception to the rule. Uh, for the most part, almost no object in the solar system other than Earth and the gas giants actually have a strong magnetic field. Uh, Mercury has a bit of a magnetic field, but it doesn't really protect us that much. So I'm going to say maybe Mercury, maybe Mercury, uh, definitely the gas giants. So we have Saturn, uh, Jupiter, and also Uranus and Neptune, and of course, our beautiful planet Earth. So let's just go with uh, this number right here, which is, I guess, um, 6 out of 42. So 6 objects out of 42 seem to possibly have a magnetic field that might actually protect them uh, from the solar radiation. But the other objects actually do not have anything, and or if they do, it's just not enough. 
And lastly, this is number six, we have temperature and this is going to be pretty easy as well because most objects are either too hot like Mercury um, and also Venus or too cold like Mars. Or actually Mars does have some temperature that's acceptable sometimes but just not enough. Uh, so I guess the more, the more corrected sort of version of this would be consistent temperature. So not just temperature but consistent temperature because like uh, say moon moon has uh 20 degrees in the, in a, during the day but it's like minus 200 during uh during nighttime so that doesn't really help us at all so consistent temperature and here it's once again only earth only earth that has good enough temperature for us to actually survive on so one out of 42 now i'm sure we can actually talk about other components and make this a little bit more complicated but i think i want to start with these very specific six components i thought it would be seven but it's actually six uh, six components that uh, we're now going to try to analyze mathematically just to figure out the chance of uh, us already having found a planet, the exoplanet that is habitable or colonizable, or finding one in the future. So we have uh, six numbers here to try to work with. So we have 2 out of 42 multiplied by 1 over 42 multiplied by 1 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 6 over 42 and lastly 1. Lastly, this is the final number, 1 out of 42. So this is sort of the simple uh, calculation uh, that will basically give us a number that will show us the probability of, uh, it, let's just say we go to a different solar system. We find a relatively similar number of um, objects that have achieved uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. What is the chance that you know one of them will actually have Earth-like conditions that we can then live on, colonize, and be happy? And this kind of a formula uh, does give you a very, very rough estimate based on our own solar system, very rough estimate of what this probability might be. So let's just do some calculation. We're going to multiply the denominator nomina uh, first to get 2 times 1 times 1 times 3 times 6 times 1, which is going to be 36 and the bottom here is 42 to the power of 6 or 42 times 42 uh, 6 times which is a very very big number it's roughly about 5.5 billion that's right 5.5 billion so let me just go to the next page and let's actually talk about this very briefly what this suggests to us is that approximately and this is very roughly uh, approximately one out of about 152 million objects uh, that we might discover in the future will be Earth-like. Now, and this is very, very rough. This is not considering some other factors and some other things, but it's, this is a very, very, very big number. So we have currently discovered approximately, and this is once again rough number, 4,000 exoplanets. We have 4,000 exoplanets discovered. Uh, every year we discover about 1,000, several thousand more. Um, but uh, most of them are basically either too hot, either too cold, or even if they are in a habitable zone, we don't really know much about them. Uh, but according to this very simple sort of calculation, only one out of 152 million discoveries will be habitable or nice enough for us to go there and to not have a suit and to live and to possibly not die right away. That is kind of, I guess you could say, disappointing. Now, does it mean that we should stop looking for those exoplanets? Well, of course not. We might actually get lucky and we might uh, f find out or discover that this number is actually much smaller. But mathematically, at least right now, based on our, our own solar system, comparing you know, uh, comparing Earth to other objects in our solar system, and uh, using what we know about life in general, the number is 1 out of 152 million. Or if you actually want to take a look at this in terms of percentages, it's approximately... 0. 0.00007 percent. That is how low that chance is. So it's basically a very, very low chance that we'll be able to discover an Earth-like planet anytime soon in the near future. And if we, even if we look for uh, each exoplanet very thoroughly, and if we find at least 5,000 exoplanets per year. It might take us roughly about 30,000 years to find another Earth-like exoplanet. Okay then, so that's not as hopeful and as exciting as I hoped it would be.
Anyway, so that's all I wanted to do in this video. I wanted to kind of show you an idea of looking for exoplanets and what is the chance of us finding an Earth-like planet sometime in the future based on what we know of our own solar system and based on what we actually know about other planets and dwarf planets in, in it. So hopefully you enjoyed this video and hopefully you learned something from it. And if you have, please subscribe, um, share this video with someone else who you think might enjoy mathematics and also uh, space and science and so on. And in the next video, hopefully I'll have my computer fixed by then and we'll do some more uh, Space Engine, Universe Sandbox, and finally get to play No Man's Sky, which I totally bought and totally installed and totally is now on my... It's basically on my dead computer, so I need to get that back and start playing it. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Game you later, and as always, bye-bye.